uh, that we're discussing every which is uh, just COVID nineteen. Uh, can, can I can I please so ask I hear, everybody to I, mute, I, mute I, their I phones, hear. please? Please mute your phones, except Dr. Leila. Okay. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, of of the virus, and then in broad terms, the classification of tests that are available for us to diagnose SARS CoV two infection which is basically the PCR and serology. And I will try to quickly go over the pros and cons uh, of, of each of them. Um, so, so the virus itself is a, is a beta chorus uh, subgenus virus. It's a, a stranded RNA uh, virus. And the RNA of that virus is, is, uh, is kind of packaged uh, or covered by this uh, nucleic acid. Uh, the viral uh, RNA recapsid is then in, uh, uh, and embraced with this uh, lipid uh, envelope. Uh, and then this lipid has uh, several proteins. Uh, the very important one is the spike protein, um, which is uh, an protein for the entry of the virus inside the host. Uh, also have the envelope, uh, protein. And, uh, and we also have the membrane. Uh, so um, these are important uh, things to remember because they constitute targets, and I will talk about uh, later on. So in terms of uh, the species, again, uh, so it's the beta viruses, and there are three line uh, lineage A, B, uh, and C. Uh, so it is in the lineage B. Uh, has very close relationship to the SARS-CoV, uh, but it also has a, a linkage to other uh, coronaviruses that are causing common cold, uh, like 43 and HQU1. Uh, it also uh, has a closer relationship with the MERS-CoV uh, viruses. The significance of that is it's important to remember because of the cross-reactivity. Uh, between uh, the virus in the detection measure between the virus, virus SARS-CoV-2 and these other common coronaviruses as well. Uh, in terms of the gene structure uh, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, it, it can be divided into uh, big uh, groups or two big regions. Uh, basically, the region which is responsible for the viral application, so the RNA-dependent polymerase, uh, and, and most important uh, genes there is, is in reading frame, the ORF1A uh, and 1B. And then the rest of the genome of the virus are for uh, producing the structural uh, proteins of the virus, uh, so spike protein, the envelope, and the uh, nucleic capsid protein. So uh, again, the importance of that you have to remember uh, there are four particular targets that we can use to detect the virus, uh, and and the most ones uh, really are the uh, R uh, F A A. -A uh, so this is the uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And there is the S gene, the E gene, and the N gene. Uh, there are two main antigenic targets, uh, which antibodies can be developed, again, to detect immunity uh, or to detect serocon. Uh, so you can have antibodies that again, the S uh, antigen, either the S1 and S2 combined, or uh, S1 and the receptor binding, or towards the nucleic capsid, the, uh, basically the N antigen. Uh, the N antigen um, can be more conserved amongst the coronaviruses and more abundant. So more, more assays uh, are available uh, directly towards the N uh, antigen. Uh, so these are antibodies basically detecting the uh, N antibodies, I should say. Uh, however, uh, the S antibodies are the ones the uh, uh, hoping when we get the vaccine are uh, the antibodies that uh, neutralize the virus as well. So um, tests for uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, can be broadly classified into two main group, either the virus detection itself, uh, and that is mainly for acute infection antibody uh, detection, which is for response. 
Um, now, the options, there are several uh, methods available. But the most popular one and the gold standard degree is the RT-PCR. Uh, but there are also other methods like the thermal amplification, the CRISPR technology. Uh, uh, there are some antigen detection are now available and, and FDA approved. Um, the sensitivity of these are uh, not very good. They are, some of them are specific. Uh, there are uh, viral cultures and sequencing also uh, are methods, but they are only available in, in research setting. Uh, in terms of the antibody detection, uh, again, you can classify them broadly into two big categories, uh, either uh, binding antibody detection methods um, or neutralize antibody detection method. And Dr. Jihad is going to talk to us uh, further about neutralizing antibodies and, and the role as well in the COVID infection. Uh, the binding antibody detection, you can have the classic point of care, uh, you know, what I call the pregnancy uh, test kind of assay, so the lateral flow, or the ELISA base, or the uh, immunomodacins, or basically the immune assays. Uh, the neutralization antibody uh, assays are classified into viral neutralizing uh, tests or super neutralizing tests. Um, the viral neutralizing test actually depends on antibodies that are in neutralizing uh, uh, culture, so living virus. Uh, you can imagine these are done in very, very specialized BLS3 uh, laboratories. Um, so the um, virus detection and antibody detection should not be considered as alternatives. They are complementing each other, really, but they're not alternatives to uh, each other. The RT-PCR is still the goal for the diagnosis, and it is the one recommended by CDC and the WHO. And let's say the diagnostic window for the RTP is about three to 14 days from the infection. So here is just a diagram straight. So basically the viral, uh, you, you know, the viral RNA is start picking that up um, by day three and, and then you continue to pick it up. Uh, week one is, is the most, uh, you know, we get really almost uh, all of it. And then, and then the viral uh, uh, titers, if you will, decrease a little bit. So by week three, more or less, uh, most people will clear the virus. This will constitute with the development of the antibodies. Now with the SARS-CoV uh, and really IgM and IgG more come about the same time. In fact, sometimes the IgM may lag a little behind IgG uh, in some studies. Not a huge difference between um, the uh, IgG and I. Uh, seroconversion. Antibodies classically uh, will start by week two and then by week three words, um, you can detect them it's all patients who got infected. Uh, in terms of the RTP uh, assays, uh, uh, different types and, and uh, configurations uh, of it, the traditional which you have to have an extraction step and then amplification and then detection step uh, so these are the ones that we have in the labs, and, and this a little bit time-consuming, but it's a very, very uh, good ask. And then, uh, you know, there are the quick creation assays uh, in which either the amplification is, is summarized or where you have extraction detection all happening uh, at the same time. Uh, things like, uh, you know, gene expert. And, and, and these really help because uh, they can speed up the uh, uh, of the virus. Reporting, uh, uh, there are four terminologies that everybody agreed to use. Uh, you either detect the virus, and basically when detected, it means that you're detecting virus more than the limit of detection of the assay, or it's not detected, which is less than the detection of the assay. And then the presumptive, uh, previously we used to call it Inclusive, and I will explain this uh, in a minute, or an invalid result. Um, so the, the terminologies, uh, what happened here in the UAE is the National uh, Committee for Emergencies and Disasters have, have kind of, uh, there is a COVID uh, uh, testing task force, and they hit on, uh, on certain terminology. Uh, so remember, I, I told you about the genes that we target, and um, 
and in, in the different assays and in configurations. And basically, uh, if you detect at least two of these genes, uh, then you can report the virus as this. Uh, now, there is one important gene, which is the ORF and B. If you detect that one, even N and E genes were negative, uh, your internal control and everything else is working, you can still report this as detected. This is a very specific gene, as, as I mentioned before. Now, the presumptive positive comes if you only have the E gene, for example, uh, reacting, or you're getting up only in the E gene, but the N gene and the ORFA and B are, are amplifying or you get only a mutation in the E gene. So one of these are, is fine, but not the others. Then you call this a presumptive positive. In this case, what you want to do, because you're not really sure, is uh, an infection which is kind of fading away, or this is an early infection, what I like to do then is to uh, repeat the test within uh, you know, eight to 72 hours, see if the patient is really kind of clearing the most probably the test is going to become negative and then that's fine uh, if in fact it was early on in the infection then uh, you may be able to pick up other uh, virus and, uh, or other genes and in this case it's uh, positive if it remains then you would uh, still call it uh, as well an invalid result is when we do not have uh, any reaction at all in, in, the, uh, in the PCR reaction. And we have internal control tell us that the reaction works, and we all have the positive controls. And when these are not working, you know that there is an inhibitor in, in this sample that basically inhibited the reaction. So this is an invalid sort of result. Um, the opposite is also true. If you have a contamination, thing is lighting up, uh, everything is positive, including your negative control, is also an invalid run. So these, uh, uh, this is an invalid and lab-related uh, issue or a contamination or an inhibitor in the specimen. Uh, so this is again the explanation for inconclusive, so the presence of one out of the three genes as, uh, as positive, and uh, it also uh, can happen with, as I mentioned to you, with the, either early on in the infection or, or later on. Uh, now, things that I have been getting uh, day and night, uh, every day, about the false negatives and positives and why that is. So uh, false negatives uh, uh, can happen uh, with the RT-PCR uh, method for, uh, for the detection of, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And you know, we can again classify them into pre-analytic, post-analytic, but the analytic factors, you know, the collection, uh, whether you're using an NP swab or a pharyngeal uh, swab, uh, so the pharyngeal um, uh, swaps are more, they have more viral yield and they're sensitive, obviously, than the oral pharyngeal swab. People are talking about saliva. Now, if you use deeper specimens like sputum or bronchial lavages, you get a better yield of the virus. Um, a UT stability sometimes, if the, if the medium that you're using to transport or the swabs, uh, if it's not very good, they could actually uh, not prevent the virus. Um, time in relation to infection, so very early or very late in the infection, when the viral is not very high, you may um, that or it may call it a negative. In fact, there is still uh, some virus. Um, specimen processing, if it wasn't transported or uh, processed appropriately, and then the limited action uh, of the assay or the analytic sensitivity. So you have assays uh, of detection of 10 copies per ml, and other assays, uh, 250 uh, copies per ml. So there are definitely a uh, difference in the limit of sensitivity of these assays. So if you go to lab A with the 10 copies per ml, uh, you know, this lab may call you positive. If you, if you go to lab B with the 250 copies per ml, you actually may test negative if you low uh, viral load. Uh, false positive, luckily, uh, we're, we're facing this uh, then the false negatives, uh, and it, it sometimes it may indicate either a, a pre-analytic or analytic uh, contamination. Uh, what we also in in our labs is is that some certain assays 
actually uh, have a, a late uh, amplification. So what happens is we actually enter what we call the cycle threshold value. So with the uh, polymerase interaction, you have cycles of amplification, and you're monitoring to see uh, with with each repeated cycle when you will detect the the, the signal virus. Um, class, you know, by cycle 20, 25, you may detect something, and most of them have a cutoff up to cycle 30, for example. So anything amplifying up to cycle 38 is considered positive, and anything after that is negative. Uh, assays can go uh, beyond uh, 30, um, 38 cycles. And, and to complete their full name, email, etc. Right. Um, Can you okay. please, could, could everybody please mute that? Thank you. So, so the, uh, these uh, uh, instruments are, and that are uh, detecting those uh, cycles, you know, it, it can sometimes uh, give you again what we call, it's not really false positive, but uh, it's rather a late amplification. So it picks up something, say cycle 42, uh, analyzer that stops at cycle 38, all this negative, but an analyzer that all the way up to cycle 45 for it may call something amplifying at cycle two as positive. Uh, and enhance the confusion again, and is this a false positive, what is that? Again, we, we clearly see uh, this phenomenon uh, in people who are cl clearing virus. So these are people who are, are still the virus, but um, you know, it fingers the virus, stay with them a little bit uh, among some of our caregivers. We don't understand what is that. We, other people also observe this. And, uh, when they culture the virus, uh, uh, that, you know, they find any viable uh, virus. You know, these are people that are shedding beyond three weeks. Uh, also due to incompatibilities, again, either between UTM and the extraction or between extraction and amplification. Uh, and false positives are more likely when the prevalence of the disease is, is low. Uh, just an illustration again uh, to, to, to demonstrate that by week one, really the study of the RCPCR is, is almost different. And then it decreases, uh, say maybe, you know, week four is to by week six really is, is deep. Uh, moving on to, to serology, so there is an array of uh, serological uh, tests available uh, to us, and, and they are either doing IgG or, or IgM, uh, or what we call the total, which is IgM together, uh, or uh, they could be a, a, a targeting the nucleocapsid antibodies, the spike antibodies, uh, ISA, there is a uh, Kimi, and so we have a different hybrid. Most of them are qualitative in nature, but some uh, quantitative assays as well. So this is just examples of, of an ELISA platform, and this is the letter flow or the point of care kind of, of assays. Um, some facts about serology, you know, as I mentioned before, is antibodies stop, you know, after two weeks of infection. And more certainly uh, by Days you will so after three weeks you will really uh, detect them. Um, total antibodies appear um, per two days earlier than the IgG spike, so maybe a little bit sensitive. Uh, there is no role of detecting IgA in serum per se. So as is detecting IgA, has no role to play in in, in this in this uh, particular disease. Um, and there are three changes really to optimize uh, testing outcome when you're using serology. Uh, these were recommended by the CDC and their interim guidelines. Uh, the first thing, you know, you choose a test with high specificity. So you really need a very specific test specificity greater than 99.5%. Uh, Focus on individuals with high pretest probability, so your high risk groups likely to be uh, exposed or having the, the, the infection. And then uh, what we call the orthogonal testing allegory, or the two-step uh, testing, um, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. If you have two tests, 
for example, uh, let us say uh, an assay that looks at antibody and an assay that looks at the antibodies, or one looks at the and one looks at the IgG specific, um, and say test number one has a specificity of 97 and specificity of 93. Uh, if you have a prevalence uh, of, of the condition uh, about 5%, then the possibility of this test alone is about 2%, i.e., if you test today on this platform and you test positive, the chances of you actually, uh, the chances of this being a real positive and if you actually having antibodies to it is, is about 42%. Now, if you test it on the other platform well, and if you, and you test it again, and if you combine these two, then really the possibility of value increases from 42% to 94%. Um, so the, the uh, two-step uh, process is, is, is about. And here is just, again, I took this from, from the guidelines. It just shows you the importance and really the importance is that with, with when the prevalence uh, of the disease is low, uh, it really is to apply the two tests to improve your value. Uh, as you can see, as this increases, then um, you know, pretty much uh, you can actually apply and test if you like, if it has a decent uh, specificity. Um, in terms of applications, uh, so serology has several applications. Uh, one of them is, is obviously clinical uh, in nature, which is to support the diagnosis of illness in late presenters. So these people who present later on in the infection after nine to 14 days, will get uh, RT-PCR, classic picture, a CT scan, whatever, uh, and you want to confirm yeah, this is really COVID-related or not, if antibody comes back positive, that could definitely help. Uh, in children, uh, presenting with a multi-system hyperinflammatory syndrome, because again, classically, these kids tend to later on in the course of the disease or in the course of infection, were really not able to detect the virus by the RT-PCR anymore. Uh, it also plays an important role in selecting donors uh, for the convalescent plasma uh, therapy. So it's advisable to test donors before you take their plasma to see uh, the, the antibodies. Um, the huge role also is in terms of the epidemiology of the disease as in the, the zero prevalence in the community. Uh, it's very, very important to calculate true case fatality and so on when you, when you do the zero prevalence in a given community and also contact tracing. Uh, there are potential applications with occupational health uh, as well, uh, again, amongst the higher risk group. Um, and then, of course, when the vaccine becomes uh, available to test the vaccination response or who should take it or shouldn't, uh, and many, many reasons uh, when it comes to, to research. Um, the limitations or one has to remember about immunology, again, is that the immunological correlate uh, of immunity is not fine. So yes, you're detecting those antibodies. Yes, the individual has serum and they have, uh, antibodies towards SARS-CoV virus, but does that mean that this individual is immune? Uh, we still don't know yet. However, the initial data or indication indicators uh, to indicate yes, maybe these uh, these uh, provide uh, protection. Um, and, and, and basically seen in, in, in China any so far, um, there were some experiments that were done on primates where the infected bodies were developed, they re-challenged those and um, they did not do the, the reinfection again. Um, and, then, and then obviously we are in the compilism plasma uh, antibodies to try to help us. Uh, but, but still, having said that, I have studies to actually, uh, uh, you know, exactly attest that yes, you do get immunity if you develop those uh, antibodies. And we have so many, things. what is the level of antibody required for this immunity if you were to get it? How long does it last? Is it, you know, a couple of months, one week, uh, two years, um, the kinetics of the antibody respond, um, and then the correlation between antibodies to the neutralization and, the, and Dr. Jihad uh, is going to talk 
uh, about this point uh, in, in a very elaborate manner. Um, other regions, as you have to remember, I, you remember I talked to you about the other coronaviruses, uh, so they could get some cross reactivity with these, could lead to a false positive result. Um, you can also get a false negative early on in disease or uh, patients who are immunocompromised or uh, to mount an immune response so deficient or on biological agents or persons. Um, so this is why uh, it is recommended to use some com uh, interpretive comments uh, when reporting uh, whether a negative result or a positive result. Uh, so basically, again, with the negative results, uh, to remind people that you rely on this, that, oh, okay, your answer is negative, you don't have COVID, no. <laughs> You have to do the RT-PCR uh, to confirm uh, whether or not somebody has COVID serology. Um, and then with the positive results, you cannot just say, oh, good, your antibody is positive, you're probably immune. Uh, I'm sorry, but we cannot really confirm that yet. Uh, so a caution about the fact that this could also be a false positive result. And this is when I say before, you know, you do two-step two -step assays. Um, there are clearly things that I don't do right now with, as far as serology is, is concerned. So serology code should not be used to diagnose a COVID-19 infection. Again, the RTP is the gold standard here and it's the mainstay. It should not be used to make decisions about group. So um, you say, oh, all these people are having antibody positive, they can together, or they can all work together. Or, they should not use that uh, at this point of time, or to make decisions about return to work, uh, to change your uh, PEs at all, uh, or PPE guidelines, and you should not use antibodies to do that. And lastly, you should not use it to immunity passports until and more the uh, durability immunity of these antibodies. Um, a lot of research applications uh, are out there, and as I said, again, the neurological value of it is, is, is very important, but there are many, many answered questions uh, that are uh, right now being researched by uh, active researchers. Um, I was really privileged to be part of, of a group uh, work together here at the uh, National Committee for uh, Emergency Preparedness uh, to develop the COVID-19 uh, guidelines on uh, the serology test, and, and we came up with several recommendations, which I just uh, shared with you uh, earlier, uh, the highlights, and, and these were, were the members uh, of, of this committee. And uh, so, in, in some closing, then uh, I again list that the RT PCR is the gold standard uh, used for the diagnosis of acute infection. Uh, I hope I gave you a flavor of, of the various pitfalls, how we interpret them, what does the result interpretation actually mean. Um, the surgical antibody assays can help in the of late COVID 19 infection uh, when the RT PCR is expected to be added in seroprevalence uh, studies and in, in contact tracings and have some role to play uh, in our health. Um, they can be uh, to certainly determine the eligibility to plasma donation uh, uh, for patients who recovered from COVID-19 disease. It is of great value in the epidemiological studies uh, of the COVID virus pandemic. So with that, I'd like to close and I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Layla. Uh, another very interesting and very informative uh, talk. Uh, in terms of, if I, if I may again, because we're, we're running very uh, late in terms of the overall uh, program and trying to stick to the, to the program, a um, couple of questions. Uh, let, I'll, I'll give the first question to Dr. Froze. Um, go ahead, Dr. Froze. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you. I appreciate that. Dr. Lela, Salam Alaikum. Salam Alaikum, Dr. how are you? <laughs> nice to see you again, yeah. My question is, uh, uh, when, when the sample is coming for COVID-19 um, uh, testing, what other markers that uh, are supposed to be important uh, to, to test in the serum or plasma of these patients? Uh, 
so uh, there are various, actually we have a panel of tests that we use for, uh, for patients present, uh, patients with a diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, so uh, we look at their functions, at their uh, kidney functions. Uh, we actually look at their uh, uh, lymphocyte count and neutrons as well. Um, we obviously as the D-dimer uh, solutions, C-reactive proteins. If that is elevated, we may also flex to the IL-6 uh, as well. Uh, we also monitor in cases the high sensitivity troponin, uh, if they're certain age or if they are with uh, cardiac symptoms. And uh, we also look at the triglycerides uh, because some uh, the abnormalities uh, there as well. I tried to squeeze in the vitamin D though, as well in, in the evaluation uh, of these patients and uh, my colleagues as well agree. Uh, and in fact, they are using this uh, as well as probiotics as well uh, for treatment of, of these patients. So, uh this is measured in all patients or selective patients, these markers that you mentioned, Dr. Laila? Uh, most of them will get of these, uh, of these tests upon it. Uh, the cardiac uh, markers uh, are, are in, in, selected, uh, in selected groups, but most of them get that basic. And the IL-6 is only done if the CRP is, is increasing. And then we also uh, add acetonin as well. Uh, to if there's any bacterial infection happening. There is one important point, Dr. Lela, asking this question because no data is published from anywhere in the world about the COVID-19 um, testing uh, with these parameters or markers that you mentioned. And if, if, if there is a data with you, it can be easily published in BMJ, okay? Uh, um, we got a publication in BMJ just last month, but now I'm keeping an eye on all the publications coming out of COVID-19. They don't have these markers. This is, this is a very, very uh, important information. And if you have maybe 200 patients, 100 patients, it can be published easily. Sure. Thank you. Sure. And, and uh, yeah, thank you. And, 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 and we have some publications from China as well, shed some light on these. Um, especially the role of the G-dimers and, and yes. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Leila, can I just, there's one, one pending question, just one question, very short uh, uh, question. Sure. We have, uh, in terms of positivity for COVID-19, not only do we get positivity prior to the symptomology, asymptomatic patients, we get positive, but also importantly, and to some extent, worryingly, uh, which you alluded to in your talk, we get positivity post symptoms. So patient has been cleared, no symptoms, two, three, four weeks after uh, the patient has, has, has been uh, 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 cleared the, the, the disease, no symptomology, um, the, the tests are still coming up positive. The question there is that how in fact, are these patients infectious? And are they worrying? And now, by culture, some of these viruses, the, the patients do not seem to show culture positivity, which implies that they're non-infectious. What, what's your take on that? Should, should, should people be worried if their that sample, if their uh, positive test, three, four, five weeks after uh, 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 the, the initial positivity, they're, they're still coming up positive? So so that's one question, Dr. Khan, and that was one of the questions I always got. Uh, and, and we tend to see, this, uh, especially in the elderly patients, uh, the virus lingers sometimes, and, and some are not necessarily elderly, healthy caregivers who have absolute symptoms, but they continue to shed the virus on two weeks, uh, beyond three weeks as well. And they're completely asymptomatic. Um, so, you know, what we end up doing is we end up actually looking at examining. So remember I talked to you about the cycle threshold. And in those patients, you can see that it is really the late amplification. It really comes at the you know, cycle 37 or, you know, almost just before just before the, the threshold. And we decided then to come up with a comment saying, you know what, it is positive, but it's really a late amplification, and that could indicate that you're clearing the virus. Um, 
We also do antibody tests on these patients, and if their antibodies test is positive, it also gives another layer of, of reassurance. However, in the absence of culture, you cannot really confirm 100% that they are not infected. Although, to your point, the studies that have looked at, at, at these these patients and cultured the virus, um, they can find any viable uh, virus detected, uh, you know, beyond two weeks in, in those patients. So, but on of this, um, you cannot just give assurances that, yeah, you can come to work. Uh, unless we know uh, a little bit more about and, and hopefully maybe serology can help with that. If the serology is positive, then this individual now is immune and, and then the individual come, come back to work and it's not infected. Uh, we cannot recommend that. So right now, we tell them to stay uh, still stay until they have their two negative CPCRs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have to move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Leila. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker um, is Dr. Jihad Al-Ghazali. Uh, Dr. Jihad is um, a consultant immunologist and chief uh, of the immunology section at Sheikh Khalifa uh, Medical City. Um, he joined uh, uh, Sheikh Khalifa um, after having worked prior to, to, to that in uh, King Fahd uh, Medical Center in Riyadh, uh, where he was also a professor of clinical immunology and consultant uh, immunologist. He is an MD and a PhD and board certified in clinical and laboratory uh, immunology, both from, from Sweden and uh, US. Uh, he's an established researcher with more than 70 publications in international journals. His main research interests are in immunopathology, infection and immunity, molecular genetics, and molecular basis of disease. Uh, Dr. Jihad is a fantastic speaker. I heard him talk a number of times before. Um, Dr. Jihad, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Khan. Thank you very much for the introduction, Take care. Professor. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the role of antibodies in COVID-19. Just one minute. I think there is a problem in uh, moving the slides. The ongoing outbreak of uh, COVID-19, and the abbreviation is for COVID-19 is coronavirus infectious disease 19. It is caused by a novel virus we abbreviated as SARS-CoV-2, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. And uh, I mentioned the first statement because there is a lot of confusions. Uh, when we are in discussions, some people, they tell you that uh, this patient has, uh, has uh, COVID-19 or this patient is infected with COVID-19. The patient is not infected with COVID-19, but the patient is infected by the virus and the virus, it is called SARS-CoV-2, or, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Uh, the virus, or SARS-CoV-2, it is an enveloped positive stranded RNA virus. And the virus has four major structural proteins on its surface. That includes the S spike antigen, the envelope E, the membrane M, and the nucleocaspid N. This is in addition to other 16 non-structural proteins. They are, their, their, their number is between 1 to 16. This is in addition to like 5 to 8 accessory proteins. And when we talk about SARS-CoV-2 immunogenicity, we talk about the antigens on the surface of the virus that are immunogenic. Immunogenic means they, they trigger an immune response. And among the surface antigens on the surface of the virus, there are two immunogenic antigens, the S spike antigen and the N nucleocaspid antigen. The S spike antigen or protein 
plays an essential role in viral attachment, fusion, and entry and transmission of the virus. And it has two subunits, the S1 subunit and the S2 subunits. The S1 subunit is responsible for the, vir for the virus receptor binding. And the S2 subunit is responsible for the virus cell membrane fusion. And it is worth mentioning that the S1, it has two domains. The S1 antigen, it has a receptor binding do domain. And I'm going to refer to in the text as RBD and the N terminal domain. And the virus or what I'm referring to, the receptor binding domain, it binds to the ACE2 enzyme, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which acts as a surface of certain host cells. And the virus, it binds to the AC receptor on several cells in the body, especially pneumocytes in the lungs, and in particularly type 2 alveolar cells, what, or we abbreviate them as ATE2 cells, and the upper esophagus and stratified epithelial cells. And there are other sites that, ex that express also the ACE receptor or the receptor for the, viral, for the virus binding, including enterocytes in the gastrointestinal tract, especially in the ileum and the colon, mitochondrial cells, and the proximal tubules in the kidneys and the bladder cells. This is why usually patients that they have lung manifestations, that they have COVID-19 and they have lung manifestations, they might also present or experience other disease diseases and it is not unusual to hear that a patient who was admitted to the ICU he developed acute kidney injury or acute heart injury they are very common this is in addition to diarrhea or gastrointestinal tract manifestations because there is they those cells they can get infected in addition to the lungs It is also worth mentioning that in host cells, in addition to the ACE2 receptor, there is another enzyme, and most of them are enzyme. The ACE2 is an enzyme, and there is another enzyme which is called abbreviated, as you can see in this figure here. Uh, it is abbreviated as TMPRSS2 and it is a type 2 transmembrane serine protease and it, it's very important because it primes the S antigen and it facilitates its, its binding to the ACE receptor and now there is a treatment that we are using in the hospital it is called camostat which inhibits the enzyme activity. This enzyme activity, it inhibits the TMPRSS2 and therefore can contribute to, the, to, to, to inhibiting the virus from binding to its receptor because it inhibits priming of the S antigen on the virus and it's binding to the ACE2 receptor. And when we talk about anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody detection, most of the assays that are available in the market now, they detect anti 